welcome PCS members and friends to our today's uh, PCS IBS seminar. It is a great pleasure to have with us today Dr. Paolo Molinini from Stockholm University. And uh, today our scientific host is Dario. And uh, I ask you, Dario, to introduce our speaker. Okay, thanks, Dylan. It's a great pleasure to have Paolo today. So Paolo started his career and actually he, he did all his studies in uh, Zurich where he got his PhD in 2019. After that, he has been postdoc in several, let's say, prestigious places in, in Europe. He has been uh, for like six, nine months, let's say slightly less than a year in Oxford. Then he moved to Cambridge. Uh, and finally, he's currently a postdoc in the University of Stockholm. Now, uh, he's working on several topics uh, and uh, according, I mean, I, I'm quoting his CV, so he's working in condensed matter physics, quantum optics, and uh, he combined many body theory, non-equilibrium physics, and also machine learning techniques uh, to study new phases of matter. And uh, I mean, among all these topics, today he's going to talk about a, a specific paper that uh, made me particularly interested in, in, uh, in what he was doing, because he was, he's also working on impurity models, like, uh, like recently we did in IBS. So uh, today's talk, the title is Anomalous Skin Effects in Disordered Systems with a Single Non-Hermitian Impurity. So Paolo, I think uh, you can start. Well, thank you very much. That was quite an intro. I'm honored. Thank you very much for having me. And it's my pleasure to, to give this talk to you today. Um, so uh, as mentioned, this is the title of my talk. It has a lot of words in it. I will try to kind of break them down as we go along. But this is contained in this paper that we put in the archive about two months ago. And it was a collaboration with uh, uh, my supervisor, Emil, and uh, uh, one of his PhD students, Oscar. Uh, so if you want to know more about this paper, uh, you can also send me an email later. Uh, of course, feel free to just ask questions during the talk whenever you feel like it. Uh, and you can also have a look at my website for, for more information about other research that I'm doing. So let's get started. Um, Non-remission Hamiltonians, really. Uh, if you think you're being overwhelmed with uh, papers on the archive that have the word non-remission in them, let me tell you, you're not the only one. Uh, so this is a graph that shows the occurrence, the hits for the words non-remission in Google Scholar for the past, say, 20 years, since 2002. And you can see that there has been a huge surge in the past three to four years. Um, but why are people interested in non-remission physics or non-remission Hamiltonians? Um, and why would we even deal with such systems when we know, for instance, that when uh, Hamiltonian is remission, we have a lot of very useful properties that we can use. Um, so the Hamiltonian can be interpreted as the energy operator and the spectral theorem tells us that remission operators have real eigenvalues. So if we have an energy operator with real eigenvalues, we can associate them immediately with the observables that we can measure in, in a lab. So it's good if, if we have real energies that we can, that we can measure. Um, another property that is very useful is that of unitarity, and that also comes uh, from hermeticity in a way, because if you take your time evolution operator as an exponential of uh, the Hamiltonian, an exponential of a remission operator is a unitary operator. And uh, unitary operators preserve probabilities uh, and normalizations. So that's a very good property in quantum mechanics. You can start with a state that is normalized. You let the system time evolve, and then you can be sure that at the end of this time evolution, your system will still be normalized uh, and well behaved. There will be no divergences that, uh, that appear. If we're dealing with a uh, non remission Hamiltonian, these properties break down. So then all of a sudden, we have to deal with complex energies, in quotes. Uh, and also, the unitary time evolution breaks down. We have a non unitary time evolution and the probabilities are not necessarily conserved. So to say things uh, in more, more modern terms with uh, the, a meme of my favorite Korean TV show, which is Squid Game, um, Hermitian Hamiltonians are good, easy. Non-Hermitian Hamiltonians, maybe not so easy. So uh, let's see how we can uh, deal with them. 
in reality, non-remission Hamiltonians are not a new concept. They've been around for many, many years uh, and they've been used in many different fields. And I'm just going to give you kind of like an overview of uh, a different uh, kind of like a history of different fields in which non-remission Hamiltonians have been used. So one of the first fields that's used in remission Hamiltonians was um, nuclear physics, and in particular, uh, scattering problems. For instance, neutron scattering, where you have, uh, let's say, a heavy nucleus, and then you're, you're uh, throwing neutrons at it, and you see how they scatter. Um, another field is that of decaying states, so systems uh, that are inherently unstable, such as uh, nuclei that are bound to uh, K or pi mesons, and people were looking at how the systems decay. Um, for instance, in the first case, people were employing uh, uh, a Schrodinger equation with a non-remission optical potential, uh, and also in the, in the second example. And why, why are non-remission Hamiltonians used in this case as well? Both systems, have in common that they're unstable and dissipated. So in the first case, um, you have a scattering problem, and when the scattering is not elastic, you can lose particles. So you can model this dissipation, this losing of particles, as an effective non-remission uh, process. And similarly, in the second example, you have um, a bound state, but it's where the nucleus is tightly bound to your K or pi mesons, and there is a high probability for either recapture of this exotic particle um, or annihilation reactions. And also this can be modeled by uh, having a Hamiltonian that is non-remission. More recently, uh, there have been uh, classical systems that have uh, been introduced with non-remission Hamiltonians. Uh, for instance, in mechanical, electrical, and optical systems. And here I just give you three different pictures of uh, three different realizations. One is uh, my alma mater in ATH Zurich uh, in the Hoover group, um, where they were constructing topological metamaterials by coupling a pendula together. Uh, in the Simon group in, in Chicago, they were using electrical circuits. Uh, and here in Stockholm, uh, the Burinan group is working in photonics and can also realize effective non-remission systems. So, what do these systems have in common? They all have some type of dissipation. Uh, for the mechanical system, it's friction. For the electrical circuits, it's some resistance. Uh, and then in the optical context, we can have losses uh, of photons, uh, for instance, making waveguides lossy and so on. And I specifically want to single out photonic systems, uh, and in particular, optical waveguides, uh, because the Maxwell equation in this media can be uh, reformulated in terms of a paraxial equation that I've written here, uh, where uh, the governing quantity is the electric field, uh, E. And you can see immediately that this uh, differential equation uh, has many striking similarity with the Schrodinger equation. Uh, so you have here a quadratic uh, spatial dependence. Here you have some effective potential, which in the case of uh, optical waveguides, um, is uh, the refracted index that can be modeled, that can be tailored um, by, by using very fast optical pulses. And then the time is represented here by uh, the propagation direction of your, of your waveguides. Um, so as a result, these systems can be used to accurately recreate tight binding models by uh, uh, working with the refracted index. Um, and they can, they can recreate tight binding models uh, where we can simulate the classical analog of the Schrodinger equation uh, and try to look at different geometries and see how, um, what, what is the physics that emerge here. Uh, and an important point is that optical waveguides can be made lossy, or we can add gain to optical waveguides. Um, and, and therefore, we can obtain an effective non-remission description, non-remission Hamiltonian description by, by doing so. Finally, um, another field in which non-remission Hamiltonians are present uh, is that of open quantum systems. So in particular, I'm thinking of setups such as ultra-cold atoms or quantum optics setups where 
um, you have a system that deals with some electromagnetic um, radiation, electromagnetic modes that can leak in and out of the system and induce dissipation effects. And one of the uh, main approaches to describe these dissipative systems is to use the so-called Lindblad master equation, which is, uh, is written here, which governs the time dependence of your density matrix in terms of a unitary part that comes from the Hamiltonian, but also a dissipative part that comes from the interaction with the path. Uh, and is given by these uh, jump operators, Ln. And um, this is kind of like the most generic Markovian master equation that can, can be uh, used to describe dissipation in open quantum systems. But sometimes people uh, don't want to work directly with this equation because, because it can be a bit cumbersome. So what one can do is to recast uh, the problem. So take some of these um, uh, operators, jump operators, and put them back into the Hamiltonian to get an effectively non-remission Hamiltonian that governs the short time dynamics. So if one is interested in a short time dy dynamics, this method with the non-remission Hamiltonian is typically okay. There's also cases. Uh, Paolo, excuse me, I have a yeah. question. Uh, this effective Hamiltonian, does it have the same uh, rank as the original one or is it different? Uh, so H effective and H, do they have the same rank? Uh, in principle, yes. If you're at exceptional points that are induced by the dynamics, you can have a lower rank of the effective Hamiltonian. Okay, thank you. No also, I have a, I mean, not similar, but let's say a question on the same on the same Hamiltonian. The fact you specified that this is a valid approximation uh, for short time, essentially because this guy, this HF, doesn't preserve probability, so probably you can use it only for short times because instead the, the, the master equation is probability preserving, right? Um, so, yeah, it is. So you can also look at it in a different way that here you're only dealing with pure states, right? You have a, a Hamiltonian that generates dynamics only for pure states. Once you go to longer time dynamics, typically the recycling terms become important. And those are the ones that induce uh, uh, decoherence and then make you go to a subspace, which is mixed. I so see. then in the long time dynamics, you cannot, you I should see. not expect to have always a pure state. But so wait, I'm sorry, a triviality. Uh, what I'm discarding is the term in which uh, L and L dagger are acting, let's say one on the left and one on the right, am I right? Mm -hmm. Okay, got, yeah, thanks. Yeah. Um, there is actually cases in which uh, you can have an effective non-remission Hamiltonian that is correct throughout the whole dynamics. Uh, Emil has a paper that is has written, I think, last year about this. Uh, but that's, uh, so you have to tailor the dissipation in a certain way to obtain that effective uh, uh, non-remission Hamiltonian. So it, it is not like, as far as I know, it's not a generic construction. But there are cases where the entire dynamics can be written as a non-remission effective Hamiltonian. Um, all right, so as we can see, non-remission Hamiltonians are not really a new topic. They've been around for many, many decades. What is new is more a new perspective that people have given to non-remission Hamiltonians. And here I want to focus on two different examples. Uh, the one which will be more the focus of my talk today deals with uh, unique phenomena that appear in non-remission Hamiltonians that are very often are connected to the the topology of the Hamiltonian uh, and topological phases that one can construct. And if you want to know more about this, you can have a look at this review of modern physics written by Emil and others um, that came out two years ago. Uh, and so, so this part deals more about the unique properties that come about from non-remission Hamiltonians in terms of like spectra uh, and uh, uh, the fact that you have left and right eigenstates and how they can interact with each other. Uh, you can also focus more on the dynamical aspects. Uh, so the fact that there is a unitarity breaking and so on. Um, and that can give you new dynamical behaviors such as divergent Lieb Robinson bounds uh, or uh, freezing of defects when you do quenches. Uh, and I have written a paper on this with my collaborators from Zurich that uh, came out on the archive a couple of months ago. So if you want to learn a bit more about the dynamical aspects, you can have a look uh, at that. Um, but uh, let's 
go to the outline of my talk. So um, since I have the same title for my uh, my talk and my paper, I thought it would be nice to go through uh, bit by bit what are the terms in the title and try to tell you uh, exactly uh, what are the three ingredients that come into play to give the results that we want. So in a nutshell, if you want to summarize the paper, the main results in one sentence, we could have this one written in green here. So we have anisotropic hopping terms in our system. It's a one-dimensional chain. And they can induce a scale invariant or scale-free accumulation of all eigenstates on one end of the chain, which is opposite to the bulk hopping direction. So you increase the hopping in one direction, let's say the right one, and the states accumulate on the left end of the site. So this is kind of like a counterintuitive non-monotonic behavior. Um, but we need all the three ingredients to understand how this comes about. So first I will tell you a bit. Uh, sorry, to understand. Yeah. This is opposite to what happened, to what would happen thanks to the skin effect, right? The skin effect will, will send all the eigenstates to the same site. Exactly, yes. Instead, okay, good. And Thanks. I will go into, into that in, in a moment, okay. yes. So we'll first talk to you about the non-remission skin effect, what it is, how it can be harnessed. Then I will introduce the impurity uh, in the form of a coupling between the first and the last sites, which is also non-remission. And then we will see how the interplay with disorder can stabilize this uh, non-monotonic behavior and still preserve the scale-free accumulation of all eigenstates. So let's, uh, let's dig right in. Let's start by exploring what is the non-remission skin effect. So let me start with very simple minimal example of a two by two non-remission matrix. Um, we can interpret that uh, as a tight body model where the, the hopping on the left is non-reciprocal to the hopping on the right. So in this case, we can keep the hopping on the right to, to be equal to one as a unit of energy. And then we modify, we change the value of alpha. And alpha, in, keep in mind, in principle, it can be a complex number because we're dealing with uh, complex matrices in the end. Um, later on, I will focus mainly on real uh, numbers because this will be a hopping. Uh, but in general, it can also be a, a, complex, uh, a complex number. So immediately, we see interesting features if we calculate the eigenvalues of the system. Uh, the eigenvalues appear with the square root, uh, whereas in emission analogs, they would appear linearly. So the uh, square root already introduces in interesting topological features because of the, the branch point and the branch cuts of the complex, log, uh, complex square root function. So for instance, if we take uh, a value of alpha and we wind around the complex plane, we can see that winding once around the complex plane swaps the eigenvalues, and you need to wind twice to go back to the original value of, uh, of your eigenenergies. Another thing that is interesting is that you can have a different scaling as you uh, make your coupling alpha smaller and smaller. So towards zero, the square root, of course, has a non-analyticity because the um, uh, the derivative goes to infinity. Uh, and, and this is very different than the case of emission systems where you have linear behavior throughout and then you're differentiable also um, at, the, at zero. Uh, and you can have perturbative expansions and so on. So this is also this type of uh, uh, divergence behavior that appears for the derivative is also one of the reasons why we have this extreme sensitivity of non-emission systems that can be also used for um, interesting applications that we will see shortly, for instance, in sensing. So moving on to the eigenvectors, uh, the eigenvectors are also, uh, also exhibit interesting features. First of all, because we are now dealing with a non-remission matrix, we have to consider left and right eigenvectors separately. They do not uh, overlap anymore. Um, and also, uh, you can see that they're not orthogonal anymore. So the, if you focus only on the right eigenvectors, we see that uh, plus square root of alpha one and minus square root of alpha one are not orthogonal vectors anymore. But you can introduce a new sense, a new type of orthogonality called bi-orthogonality, 
by considering left and right eigenvector in a kind of enlarged uh, space. So this concept of uh, right, left eigenvectors, or orthogonality, and so on, they have to uh, be extended for non emission systems. Uh, and finally, uh, at alpha equals zero, uh, which is the branch point that we saw before, uh, we have what is called an exceptional point. And these points are very interesting because both the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors coalesce at the exceptional point. We have a degeneracy, which is also one of the uh, motivations why we can um, connect non-emission uh, effects to top topology in the end. So both eigenvectors and eigenvalues coalesce. Uh, and also note that left and right states become opposite. And we, this is kind of like a precursor of the non-remission skin effect that we will see for lar larger system sizes. So the right eigen state is totally localized in the, on the right side in this notation, and the left eigen state is localized on the left. So we have sorry, opposite May I ask you a question? Uh, yeah, of course. Yeah, the, uh, sorry, the, I, I think I understand what you mean by minimal. But uh, I wonder if you uh, uh, add the, uh, the overall uh, weight uh, phase factor to your Hamiltonian, for example, mm -hmm. uh, then uh, uh, it becomes a different problem or uh, 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 regarding the physics where it, it, it gives the uh, same physics. A phase I just factor wonder to the whether diagonal popping. Uh, no, the, the uh, just- To the uh, off diagonal, sorry, I mean, yeah. Yeah, off diagonal. Uh, yeah. If you so I consider the... alpha as a complex number. So I just kept one as my unit of energy. So alpha already contains the phase in itself because it's, it can be a complex number, right? Yeah. So you can I mean, write the, that as the... a magnitude and a, and a complex phase. And the phase yeah. is important to get this kind of uh, behavior around when you when you, for instance, rotate around the complex plane. I see. So the, the only the important quantity is the uh, 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 the ratio uh, between one and alpha. Yeah, in this case, yes. So you could I just put one to have a unit of energy, but yeah, you can have a, an alpha and beta, and then the important thing is the ratio. Yeah, I see. Thank yeah. you. Um, okay, so let's uh, let's go on to something a bit more interesting. So let's. Uh, let's add some more sites to this minimal model. Um, so in this case, the system is called uh, Hatano-Nelson chain. Uh, it was uh, proposed, I think, first in 1996 by the two uh, physicists Hatano and Nelson. It actually was in the context of superconductivity, so it wasn't really uh, the context of photonics or, or something that we're looking at today. Uh, but the main ingredients uh, is still this kind of non-reciprocal hopping where you have TL and TR. Uh, in, in this case, I'm, I'm keeping TL and TR uh, uh, as two different parameters. So this kind of probably relates to the question that was just asked. Uh, so the physics is uh, inherently the same if you keep both um, as different parameters or if you just set one as a unit of energy and then just look at the ratio. Uh, so this chain consists of uh, equal sites. So it's a single band model with non-reciprocal hopping. Uh, and you can see that the in matrix uh, form formulation, we have a non-remission matrix that describes this type of tight binding Hamiltonian. And here I give the open uh, boundary conditions and the periodic boundary condition Hamiltonian, uh, because one of the striking features of uh, this uh, many body non-remission systems is that the spectrum with open boundary conditions is completely different than the spectrum with periodic boundary conditions. And this is something that we're not really used to in air emission physics, right? We also have the, uh, in topology, for instance, we have the bulk edge correspondence. So we can relate the properties of the uh, periodic system, the spectrum of the periodic system to the properties of the open system. Whereas here, things become much more complicated. So we can see, for instance, for the open boundary condition here on the left, uh, that we have purely uh, real eigenvalues. Um, and we can still see this kind of square root envelope that we saw before for the minimal example. But if we add just these two elements here in the matrix correspond to the uh, hopping, an, an additional hopping between the first and the end site, 
we can see that the spectrum becomes completely different. First of all, uh, it, it is in general complex, and also the shape overall of the spectrum is, is different. Um, for the open system, we also see that uh, if we move towards increasing non-reciprocity in the hopping, so if we make TL and TR very different from each other, we have an accumulation of eigenstates at the boundaries. And this is shown in this uh, short uh, GIF for video. So here, JL uh, is just another notation for TL, uh, and JR is another notation for TR. So we're keeping the hopping to the left fixed at one, and then we are decreasing the hopping to the right. And then you see that all eigenstates that are plotted here in color, they, they start to pile up at the boundary, at the skin of the system. And that's why this effect is called non-remission skin effect. Um, we can see that there is this extreme sensitivity to boundary conditions also by looking at the extreme case where we have uh, TL equals zero, so there is no hopping to the left, there is only hopping to the right. So in this case, we are here. Uh, all the states at the end sites are at the end sites in the boundary, uh, in the open boundary system, uh, and the eigen energies are zero. Whereas for the periodic boundary condition system, we have block states with uh, complex uh, uh, eigenvalues. So we have completely different behaviors. And this is a stable phenomenon. There is sensitivity to boundary conditions as long as the magnitude of the two uh, hoppings is different. So TL and TR are different in magnitude. So another question that we can ask is, uh, what is the behavior of the skin effect as we increase the system size? So what is the scaling with, with N? And here I show you another video uh, where we're keeping the parameters fixed now at a given ratio. So the hopping uh, is more towards the left in this case, but we're increasing the number of sites. And you can see that uh, the uh, eigenstates, they always pile up around the same sites. So there is a, uh, the, the most eigenstates are at one, site one, then they decrease a bit, site two, site three, and then by site four, they're completely uh, gone. And if you increase the system size, the, the eigenstates are still at the same, they're still accumulated at the same size. So by increasing the system size, what we're making, uh, we're making uh, the skin effect more and more localized on the skin of the system. So the longer the chain, the more localized the skin effect. And um, this is a, a property that we shall return to uh, when we consider the effect of impurity. And if you think in terms of mesoscopic system, this is not really ideal uh, because you would like to have uh, a more controllable skin effect where you can control the localization, not just by uh, working with the hopping. So uh, let's see what we can use these non-remission systems for. Uh, so, so far we only looked at the math. Uh, the math is very interesting. But um, non-emission systems are not just a mathematical curiosity, they can also have applications. And one of these applications is uh, for sensing. It is was shown about three years ago by Emil and, and Jan Budic in this uh, PRL. Um, so one of um, the systems that they consider, although their uh, claims is rather general, is another type of non-emission tight binding model. It's a non-emission Sue Schrieffer Hager model or chain, um, where instead of having one band like before in the ethanol now, so now we have two bands because we have two different flavors, two different types of sites, the A and the B sites. Uh, and between the A and the B sites, there is hopping, and this hopping is staggered. So the hopping, uh, let's say from the blue to the red, uh, it has a given value T2, which for now we take as a remission. Uh, uh, value, so there is uh, reciprocity between these two. Uh, and the hopping between the red and the blue is non emission. So we have a baseline T1, and then we can work with a non-reciprocity parameter gamma um, that indicates how much, how strong our non hermeticity is. So this uh, system is interesting because for an odd number of sites, this is important, it has to be a, an odd number of sites, 
there is one isolated zero energy state, which has a very simple and exact solution. So the, uh, the wave function for the right eigenstates and the wave function for the left eigenstates are both given by power laws. So they, they can decay as a function of, of the sites uh, that you're looking at. Uh, but the basis uh, is, has different, in principle, different values. So you can see here, if gamma is non-zero, then R, R and R, L are different. So you can have uh, a different um, behavior of the left and the right eigenvectors. And in, in, in particular, you can get regimes when uh, the non-reciprocity is big enough, where um, the uh, right and the left eigenvectors have opposite localizations. And just to make sure that left and right eigenvectors do not necessarily mean left and right in the chain, I've plotted here the case where the left eigenvectors is localized on the right, and the right eigenvectors is localized on the left. Um, so I, I wanted to also tell you that this is just a different flavor of the non-remission skin effect that we just saw, where we have non-reciprocity in the hopping, uh, and that leads to uh, a different localization property of, of your eigenstates. So how can we exploit that in our sensing applications? So we couple the ends. Uh, and we couple the ends with, in this case, uh, remission perturbation big gamma. Uh, and to do that in a more experimental friendly setup, you can just curl up the chain to have a quasi-ring-like structure. And then we can think of having some system, some measurement that is what we want to measure that interferes with the first and the, and the last site and induces a coupling gamma between the two. And then the idea is to uh, perform a spectral measurement of our um, non-remission uh, SSH chain and then see if we can relate the change in the spectrum to uh, this uh, coupling gamma that is induced by the measurement. Uh, and to do that, we employ um, uh, perturbation theory, non-degenerate first order, non-degenerate perturbation theory is enough. Uh, of course, we are dealing with non-remission systems, so it has to be generalized to non-remission Hamiltonians. Uh, but this was already shown here in the paper that I flashed at the very beginning by Shannon and Walker. Uh, so because we have a sorry, finite... Sorry. Yeah. Hello. Yeah, uh, is, is there a reason to have odd number of sites? Uh, the less? reason is, yeah, the reason is that you want to have, uh, wait, let me just go back. You want to have this simple exact solution where okay. oh, my mouse is frozen. Okay, I'll just use this one. Um, you want to have uh, the odd number of states to have this simple exact solution that appears only when you have odd number of states. So okay. you can have this analytical solution when you have an odd number of states. Okay, thank you. Okay, so my mouse somehow stopped working. Let me see if I can. Okay, I'm just going to use the pad. Okay, it started. Um, so oh. we were here. So because we have this finite, this uh, analytical solution for the uh, uh, left and right eigenstates, we can plug them in in this formula for the, the perturbation. And we also obtain an analytical result for the perturbation itself. Uh, and if we uh, go to the limit of very large uh, number of sites, we can see that this perturbation in the energy spectrum will behave as an exponential. And the, the exponent of this exponential behavior is positive if and only if the left and right eigenstates are located at opposite boundaries. But we saw just before that this is possible by just tuning the non-reciprocity non to be big enough. Uh, and in fact, here I plot this, uh, this function here analytically. We see that at small values of n, if this is the case, if the left and right eigenstates are opposite, we first have an exponential decay, but then the function changes and becomes monotonically increased, increasing with an exponential behavior at long, uh, larger system sizes. So what does that mean? That means that we can uh, perturb the system. I have a system. question. Yeah. 
So in this case, how can you verify your perturbation because your delta E become very big? How can you still use the perturbation theory? Um, so the perturbation theory I will show later has limits to the gap of the system. So there is a certain point where uh, your perturbation will be as large as the gap of the system so it will break down. But the key is that you want to make this very, very small such that even if you have an exponential behavior, it still be smaller than the gap of the system. So you could still, you're still able to measure something and the perturbation theory still holds. But basically with any kind of like linear dependent of the gap, you have to exponential de uh, dependent on, on this delta E. So it will break down at last end, of course. So at a certain point it will break down, but if yeah. gamma is very, very small, then this exponential will also be small. Okay. I will show you a slide just like in, in one minute. So maybe that will clear things up. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so but the main thing that I wanted to say is that we have an exponential sensitivity. The larger the system, because this exponential has N in the exponent, the larger the system, the more accurate the measurement you can do. So you can go to smaller and smaller values of gamma and still get uh, a, a finite change in, in the spectrum and measure it. And this enhancement does not rely on any fine tuning. It's a stable phenomenon. It is immune to local perturbation. Um, and since first order non-degenerate perturbation theory was used, we are not expecting a big change in the eigenstates themselves. So the eigenenergies will shift, but the eigenstates uh, will not shift very much. Uh, I have another question. Yeah. The reason you have this because of the state, uh, like localized at the at the at the before you coupling, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Okay, thank you. So here is just a numerical check, and maybe, I hope this can address the question I was asked before. Um, so the solid lines are perturbative results, and the dots are the numerics. So the perturbative is the expression that we just calculated. So what I mean by exponential sensitivity is that you can make your gamma smaller and smaller. And then if you increase system size, you will be able to extend this region of linear behavior. I mean, linear, in, this is like a log scale. So it's exponential. Uh, but at a certain point, like uh, uh, the comments was saying, uh, the perturbation will be too big for the system. And then you will uh, move away from this exponential sensitivity because you'll reach the, the value of, of the gap of the system. But as long as you keep your gamma small and you increase your system size, you can still be in this regime where you have an exponential sensitivity. Okay, so, uh, so we've seen what is another emission skin effect. We have seen that it, we can use it for interesting applications as well. It's not just a mathematical uh, I may ask one question. Yeah, go ahead. So in physically, if you have the on-site interaction between uh, between particles, then you can have a case that you cannot localize basically at the end. So in the real physical system, you can have the situation where you have the on-site interaction between particles, and so you cannot localize the end. So in 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 actually real system, do you think that you still have this kind of like sensitivity? Um, so the ideal platforms were to test that, and I know that there is some experiments that are going on already, and they have already found some evidence for that. Uh, the typical test bed is uh, photonics uh, experiments, where you can engineer to not have any ah, okay. unsigned interaction. So you can okay. only have this hopping. So this would be like the ideal platform were to test that. But in, in a more condensed matter, uh, solid state type of situation, you will be absolutely right. There will be some, some difficulties. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so let's examine uh, how impurity physics comes into play here. Um, so this is the atom uh, of Nelson Hamiltonian that I showed before. Now we're adding this additional impurity uh, that couples the, uh, the first and the end sites. So we have seen um, the reason why why you call it impurity rather than closing the the boundary condition is because the gamma l and gamma r are not uh, tl and tr. Let's say they are uh, they are different, right? Yes. Otherwise, they would be just. Now you just spoiled my slides because <laughs> I was going to tell exactly that. Ah, okay. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's fine. Uh, exactly like you said, 
So we have this very nice exponential sensitivity uh, to boundary conditions and so on, but nothing tells us that we still have to keep TR and TL between the two sites. We can also have something else. And then precisely like you said, we can interpret that as an impurity in our non-remission hopping. Um, and the coupling between the first and the end site can also be non-remission itself. It doesn't have to be remission. Uh, and so this is uh, the way that we introduce uh, impurity physics into it. And, and the way we do that, and the reason we do that is that we want to have an additional control parameter to control the localization of our um, eigenstates. And we will see shortly that this induces a different scaling behavior as a function of n when you have that as a, as a form of impurity. Um, so let's uh, let's tackle this by looking again at the uh, uh, Hamiltonian. And again, here we will be able to get some analytical expressions. Um, so what is the physics that is introduced by the impurity? First, let's look at the case of only the impurity. So we only have this coupling between the first and the end site, and then all the sites are coupled. Then obviously we can solve this matrix exactly. This has a uh, order two exceptional point, and then all the eigenstates are zero, and all the eigenvectors are localized at different sites. So we have a perfect localization at every site. The interesting physics or the interesting phenomenon appears when we add an arbitrary coupling between the other, the other, the other uh, sites. We see that immediately for any arbitrarily small coupling, all the, syst all the states localize to the left. And why is that? So note that we can also have an arbitrarily small hopping to the right and still the localization is, is still on the left. This is because what matters is only that we have some type of coupling between the sites uh, and our impurity acts, acts as some sort of plug that uh, concentrates all the eigenstates here. So here we only have gamma R, for, for, for instance, we, we are only ne we're neglecting gamma L. So if you only have gamma R, all the uh, eigenstates will coalesce on the first site. So it doesn't really matter if you have TR or TL, as long as there is some connection, this will be the dominant energy scale and everything will localize here. Uh, so we have a very interesting non-monotonic phenomenon, but this is very fine-tuned, right? As soon as we have some type of coupling between the sites, everything will uh, right away um, localize on the left. So another thing Paolo, that... Can, can I ask something? Yeah. So, so if you put, for example, some excitation somewhere in the middle of the chain, which would be in the back here in your in your uh, mm -hmm. here. picture. Yeah. So so what you would have with time evolution would it move first uh, with this tr? It would move towards the site n, and then finally with gamma it would end in in site one. Then mm -hmm. is, is that yeah. the the correct? Uh, I think so. We haven't looked at uh, dynamics, but I think that's that's also what I would expect. Mm -hmm. That you okay, have like you. this first depends also which state you start from, right? But yeah, if you start from a state that is completely localized, like the the one the ground state of gamma r only, then I would assume yeah that first you migrate there and then you localized on the first site because by of this plug effect. Mean, by dynamics, you mean solving the time dependent Schrodinger equation with this h? Uh, oh. Sorry, I didn't get the question. What do you mean by dynamics? Both. Question to both Tilen and you. Is it the time? Uh, yeah, so yeah. You want to solve or yes. something? Yes. yes, time. Okay. Uh, so also, I have, uh, I have another question. Uh, I mean, I understand that this localization in, I mean, I will tend to think that this localization in one happens because, let's say, TR is very small. So this, let's say, may things move towards the left, but when you arrive at and finally, I mean, okay, so the point is that suppose that you don't have gamma R, you have only TR, very small. So this creates the standard skin effect and you localize mm -hmm. on the left. Then you turn on gamma R and gamma R, what it does for you is to move everything to the right. I yeah. guess this picture get or, or bre breaks in some way when TR 
maybe smaller than gamma r, but is sufficiently large, then things will be more similar to some periodic boundary condition, am I right? Yeah, so you're absolutely right. This is a, an effect that is only, this like non-monotonic behavior appears uh, only as, as soon as you turn on TR, but any final value of TR will immediately localize everything to the left. So that's why we need this order, or and I will show you that. don't localize at all. Here I'm confused. I would think that it doesn't localize at all because when it arrives at 10, then gamma r move again to, to one. Mm -hmm. Instead you say that, uh, that no, uh, it localizes at the left. This is, this is, I don't get, this I don't get it. So, t, so gamma r, what it does is that it localizes everything to the left if there is some coupling between the sites, right? If there is, that's right. what we saw in the previous slide. So if we right. have, yeah, if we have only gamma r, then you have this picture. Correct. We have, we have only localization here. I mean, you have localization here and then localization on two, three, because there is no communication sure. between the, the sites. Sure. Uh, but then if you, as soon as you turn on TR, there is some form of communication, but this is still the dominant energy scale. So um, TR will only act as a bridge to connect all the sites. Okay. And then the, everything will still localize on the first side because this is the dominant hopping. I right? agree. And, and yeah. when instead we are start to be not, not exactly equal to gamma r, otherwise it will be a boundary condition. But when TR is similar to gamma r, what happened? You have something Then you start to localize more on the right. And this was exactly my next point. Um, okay. So you can solve this system analytically uh, also when you have T, both TR and gamma r finite. And we're still considering only the case of hopping to the right for simplicity. The same physics happens when you, had, when you add some left hopping. Uh, but mm -hmm. it's nice to, to work with exact solutions, which we can have for um, right hopping. Uh, sure. So we can get an exact form of the energies and an exact form for the eigenstates, the rights. In this case, we're only focusing on the right eigenstates, the left are equivalent. And you get to see exactly these two pictures. Sorry, can, can I ask a question here? Sorry. Yeah. Okay. So this, uh, I agree that if you have only gamma R, then all the states are localized on the left. But as soon as I put, let's say, finite value of gamma L, then the number of states localized on the left will also depend on that value, right? Yeah, you can you can effectively always renormalize that into an effective ratio, gamma R or gamma L. So, so the, that means that depending on gamma L, the critical value after which I will get the full localization will depend on uh, it be shifted, yeah. It will be shifted. The qualitative picture okay. will be the same, but it will be shifted by you know the ratio between the two. Okay, thank you. So you you can see the the behavior here. Um, this is the uh, what we use as a measure of localization is the mean center of mass or m com for short, which is nothing by the square amplitude of uh, the eigenvalues, average all uh, the eigenvectors. Sorry, average all the possible eigenvectors. And then we can recalculate the mean center of mass of that quantity. And that can be also calculated analytically because we have the analytical expression here. Um, and the result is precisely the picture that, um, that Dario was saying before. So you can localize uh, on the left if you gamma R is the dominant, um, uh, the dominant energy scale. But as soon as you turn on TR to become comparable to gamma R and even stronger, then you're eventually dominates uh, in the hopping to the right and then you localize on the right. So you kind of lose this um, non-monotonic behavior that we saw before. It's only a fine-tuned thing where you add TR as, uh, as a perturbation. And another thing that I wanted to, to tell you is that the localization properties uh, are also different in terms of the scaling that they have with them. So remember this movie that I showed you before without impurity? So here we have, as we increase n, we have a progressively uh, more localized uh, skin effect. So more and more on the skin of the system. So with the impurity, what we have is the following. So you can see that we increase the system size, but the eigenvectors are still localized at the same fraction of the chain. So this allows us to control the localization a bit better. Um, by, by also working with mesoscopic systems. 
So the, the localization is called scale free in this case because it is not affected by the chain length. So you can change the scale of the system and the localization stays uh, stays the same. So uh, what have we achieved? Um, so what have uh, we achieved sorry, by adding sorry, the impurity? Uh, sorry, again, so this, uh, again, if you turn on a finite gamma L, that will also be the case or there will be like uh, some is uh, system size dependence on this localization? Um, no, the, the linear, the dependence is uh, is maintained also in the non-remission limit, actually. I will show that later. Okay, thank you. So what have we achieved in summary by adding this impurity? So one, we can control the localization with the impurity and strength, which is good. Number two, we have the scale-free localization, which can also allow us to work with more mesoscopic systems, which is also good. Uh, but unfortunately, we lost this non-monotonic behavior that we had uh, at the very beginning when we added the, the hopping on top of the impurity. So is there something that we can do to retrieve this non-monotonic behavior? And the answer is yes. And that's how disorder comes into play. So now we're adding uh, on-site disorder on top of our Tano Nelson model and the impurity uh, between the first and the, and the end site. So what does disorder do um, in general? We know already from the 50s, due to the pioneering work of Anderson, uh, that in a tight binding model plus uh, random on-site disorder, we have localization, or better said, um, uh, this prevents diffusion. But for our purposes, those two are kind of equivalent. So if we plot the eigenvectors, the eigenstates, as a function of the disorder strength, we can see that they progressively localize more and more on the, the locations where the disorder is strongest. So the idea now is to add this disorder to a, the Atano Nelson chain to slow down the hopping that we have on the right and stabilize the non-monotonic behavior uh, that we saw um, from the hopping on the right on top of the impurity. So we, we take, like I said, we take the Atano Nelson the impurity and now we add uh, local disorder uh, on top and see, let's see what we get. So the results are shown here in these plots and uh, I know I'm almost out of time, but I'm almost done. So please bear with me another two minutes. Um, so the first panel is again, the uh, MCOMP, the mean center of mass. Uh, and immediately we see here that there is a new uh, phase that appears due to the disorder. So this is, by the way, I forgot to say, this is with some finite disorder, obviously. So the, the point B here is shown here where we show the eigenvector localization. Uh, the, the thick black curve is the mean value of uh, all the uh, average eigenvectors. And this dashed vertical line represents the uh, mean center of mass. So you can see that in this phase um, where we have strong impurity, but the weak hopping and some disorder, um, we are basically still kind of localized at every site the average localization is in more or less in the center of the system. Now we can reinstate our non-monotonic behavior. We increase the hopping on the right to the right. So by going vertically here in the parameter space, we arrive at phase C and we see that uh, all the states then progressively localize more and more to the left. Then if we increase the value of the hopping again, uh, eventually this uh, effect is reversed and then we end up in the uh, phase where we have localization on the, on the right. Um, so, but the main thing is that we have managed to make this non-monotonic behavior uh, a finite phase where we can control it by simply changing the, the hopping uh, to the right. And um, while we added uh, disorder to make sure that we have this non-monotonic behavior, we also have to make sure that um, we have not ruined the scale-free behavior. Uh, and this is shown here in this panel F, uh, where this, uh, these dots represent um, the uh, uh, localization length psi of our states fitted as an exponential, both from the left and from the right for, for both phases, the left localized one and the right localized one. And you can see that they perfectly lie on, uh, on a linear slope. So this is the evidence that we're still preserving the scale-free localization 
and this has to be confronted with um, this horizontal line that corresponds to the normal non-remission skin effect where we have um, uh, we have no dependent with, dependence with M. Uh, and finally, so, I just I wanted to I, go back I, to the question that uh, somebody asked about so what's this, the uh, the role of gamma gamma L. So in this case, we are uh, sorry the, the role of TL in this case, but gamma L is equivalent. Um, so here we have uh, uh, her emission hopping. So both TL and TR are the same, and we still see that there is this non-monotonic behavior. Uh, of course, we lose the right localized phase because uh, there is no preferential direction in the bulk hopping, but we can still have this behavior of uh, increasing the hopping and, and uh, localizing more to the, to the left. So I think Dario had a question or someone had a question. Yeah, I've been a little bit. Uh, so the non-monotonic behavior that you refer is uh, the region C. Yeah, going from B to C, yes. Uh, what is non monotonic? Sorry, I, I'm getting what is non monotonic. So I call it non monotonic because maybe non monotonic is not the right word, but uh, it's maybe counterintuitive. You increase hopping. Okay, non monotonic in the sense that you increase the hopping to the right, right? Just let's focus on. The ah, and line. you localize more to the you left. You localize then. more on the left, and then eventually you localize again on the right. I see. Okay. So in that case, it's not monotonic. So the, the localization first goes to the left and then eventually goes to the right by increasing the same parameter. But so, uh, no, wait. Okay, yes, this I understand. But so what do you gain by, by, by adding the disorder? So it, it, to me, it looks that the disorder is essentially creating the new phase B, mm -hmm. but but the behavior between C and D is exactly the same that you had before. So what did you gain? Uh, well, we gained the fact that we can tune uh, the bulk hopping only and the one to the right only and still localize to the left. So we have reduced kind of like the number of parameters that we that we need to uh, control to control the localization. And we can control so localization both to the left the and to the right. Case, in the previous case, instead, what was the behavior that you didn't want? Sorry. Eh? The behavior was uh, uh, was an immediate behavior, so it wasn't it was fine tuned. Ah, so if I, I go see. back. Okay, got it. Got it. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so, so now now an infinitesimal tr is not enough. You need a finite tr. Exactly. So you can control okay. the parameters. Uh, so here, an arbitrarily small perturbation localized everything immediately to the left, whereas here we can really tune. Okay. It's, it's okay. promoted to a full phase. In a sense, yeah. Okay, got it. Uh, so I'm very out of time. So I'm just going to flash you with the conclusions, um, if I can get to them. All right. So, so we've seen uh, many different things. Um, I hope that I was able to show you uh, qualitatively new aspects of localization physics uh, in non-emission systems due to this interplay of disorder and purity physics. Uh, I want to highlight that many of these systems actually have very relatively simple descriptions, and we can get analytical solutions out of them, like uh, this uh, solution for the uh, for the eigenvector and the eigenvector localization through the uh, mean center of mass. And finally, I also give you I also gave you some prospects for applications of this localization physics uh, and non-emission skin effect in sensors. And uh, I'm happy to answer further questions. Thank you for the attention. Thank you, Paolo, for this uh, nice presentation. Let us thank Paolo. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, we have time for questions. So uh, thank you. Thank you for the nice talk. So, I have a question regarding this uh, disorder. So mm -hmm. uh, when uh, we like you have the scale free localization, then you introduce the disorder to again realize the non monotonic behavior. Yeah. So so but disorder is necessary, but the I think there is a competition between the disorder strength and the uh, hopping at the boundary and the bulk. Can you comment on that? 
Uh, yes, so unfortunately, I don't have another slides, but in the paper, um, we show uh, this figure for different uh, values of the disorder. Mm -hmm. uh, and what the disorder does is to shift basically these phases to higher values of the hoppings, uh, both for the bulk and for the impurity. Okay. So you will get similar, a similar behavior, but everything is shifted more uh, to the upper right corner, let's say. Okay. Okay, and one more question. So, uh, uh, there there are there are also works where uh, people have like uh, periodic boundary condition, but only very large on-site potential at one of the site. So, uh, so uh, do you think also similar uh, behavior also gonna happen there with respect to a single on-site, very large single on-site potential? So with respect to the non-monotonicity? Yeah. Uh, presumably, so I, I, I would have to look at the paper more, more closely, but the main ingredient that the disorder introduces is the fact that you kind of slow down the hopping in one direction because there is disorder. And so mm -hmm. there is a tendency for the particles to localize uh, at the states where the disorder is largest. So I okay. would assume that they should also work there. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. We have question also from Sergey. Yeah, uh, I want to come back to this um, question actually of, uh, of Tillen, which is uh, what happens uh, in, if you evolve the system and you place your some initial excitation somewhere. Now you have a non-hermission impurity, which means that the the, total, the norm is not conserved in the system, right? Mm -hmm. So then, what will happen in the long run if I place my initial state with some given norm somewhere? Will it blow up to infinity, or will it die out, or what will happen? Um, so typically, these are non-equilibrium systems, so you have to maintain the non-equilibrium in a certain way. So what people do in photonics, for instance, they have effective gain and effective loss. So they have to keep pumping photons in for all the photons that come out. Otherwise, yeah, it would eventually just, everything will leak out. So okay. you have to maintain this artificially. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We also have a question from Alexei. Yes. Curious whether instead of on-site disorder, did you consider hopping disorder? Would that change anything? Uh, we have not considered that. It's a very good question. Uh, I'm assuming it should have not the same impact because it would just give a, a different velocity at every site, but you would still have uh, a tendency to move towards uh, the other side of the system. So you need something that uh, it kind of restrains the particles from moving. And I think a potential, a low on-site potential is more suited to that. Mm. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Do we have any other questions from the audience? Well, there is the, the, the question that I usually ask uh, all the time people talk about skin effect. Uh, how much of this physics, or uh, is there anything that you can say about uh, what happened when you have when you add interaction and you consider a many body setup? Um, yeah, I mean, one would have to add interactions and see. <laughs> uh, we haven't looked at in, uh, like many fully many body interactions. Um, because here, here, everything is single particle, right? You don't yeah, have any- Yeah, the thing is like, it's very hard to engineer interactions between photons in photonics. So mm -hmm. it's typically not like the first question that you ask when you want to realize mm -hmm. that in those uh, setups. I see. Uh, so it is a valid question theoretically from an experimental point of view, at least in photonics, it's a bit less relevant, but okay. yeah, one eventually should, look into these problems and see how these features are modified. And I, I presume that there is a lot of things that change and maybe we can even enhance some effects uh, by, by adding interactions. By the way, I see, now I understand. So in, in, in photonics is really the other way around with respect to Anderson localization. I mean, everybody 
in Condensed Matter, say that Anders localization is uninteresting because interactions are always there. Instead, you say in photonics is exactly the opposite. Interactions are uninteresting because in photonics you usually don't have interact. I see. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I never considered such a twist. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I see Alexei has a raised hand. Is uh, do you have more questions, Alexei? Yes. Um, I realized I forgot to ask. Does it make sense? To go to higher dimensions with this effect carry over yeah i think so yeah um then i think probably it makes more sense to talk in two or three dimensions because there you really have a skin right i mean in one dimension the skin is just one site so but it's in two dimensions or in three dimensions you really have a skin like a, as, a, as the boundary of your of your system so it should absolutely work there. We have not we have not looked at that, but you need to construct some coupling in two D, which is a bit is a bit harder. And in photonics, they can only go up to two D because the third direction, like I mentioned at the beginning, has to be used for um, for the propagation of the light, and that tells you it is the analogous uh, the analogon of the uh, the time in the Schrodinger equation. Uh, well, I guess they probably can use synthetic dimensions, actually. Um, yeah, you can use really... floquet, you can use other things, yeah. Mm. But it's a okay. bit harder to realize. No, not impossible. No, <laughs> not impossible. Obviously impossible. Okay, we also have a raised hand from uh, Zung. Yeah, so I have a question. <laughs> You look at the slide maybe 22 where you have a lot of equations. 20, uh, slide 20. 22. So the very 20, last 20, one. 20, yeah, 20. Slide 20, I think. 20. Oh, the previous one. Let me see. I remember that you have the. Ah, the probably slide this one, the... right? Yeah. This, this, this one. has a lot of equations. <laughs> yeah. So my really question is as what happened when you when take n to infinity big n to infinity um so i've looked at finite but large n uh and yeah. you still have the scale free localization i have not looked at large of inf n equal to infinity but i assume from this equation that you still be confined uh, between between one and n, or between one and the value given by this ratio here, because this term would drop out, um, and this is so like a, an n square root, so it would be one. Uh, so I'm assuming, yeah, one would have to look at this more carefully, but I'm assuming that it should yeah. still be well behaved. Because the uh, the the one. When when and it big things, uh, you need to careful with uh, the denominator. Uh, it could have something to do with that. Yeah, we haven't really used the fact that n goes to infinity anywhere. N was always finite yeah. in all the calculations. Okay, because like when you look at this, when you take uh, n to infinity, last it has then one minus something also close to one. That's... Yeah, this is zero and this is infinity. So that's why I said one should look into the limit a bit more carefully. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Are there any other questions? Seems not. So in this case, let us thank Paolo again. Thank you. And thank you all for joining. Uh, with this, we conclude 